Okay, this is a continuation of chapter 2, so hopefully we'll finish chapter 2 today. And so we were talking about particulate matter, and just as we ended the last one. So this is moving into nitrogen. We've already talked about nitrogen quite a bit. And you can see oxygen plus nitrogen plus pressure, which we're going to have in an engine, and high temperatures are going to deal with and create emissions in the nitro uh, nitrogen world. So we have multiple different kinds of if emissions, nitrous oxide, nit nitrogen dioxide, and then I don't know three, four, five, or six. So just they just fall under NOx. So there's a lot of them, and just you know, so you know, we they've been trying to deal with them and trying to reduce them. So you at this point should know that that's one of the main target emissions. So if they ask you that on your ET exam, it's going to be what two things? So, NOx, <coughs> we're controlling NOx, and what's the other one? CO. We've been talking about this for a while. Particulate matter. So the two categories, all of the NOxs, all of them, falls under NOx. So nitrous oxides and particulate matter. Those in the diesel engine are the two emissions that this whole chapter is revolving around and how do we reduce particulate matter in NOx and the two of them are the solution is opposites of each other so the solution to one creates the other the solution to that one creates the other one nitrous oxide that's not the same that you're talking about for not NOS. NOS nope and we talked about that in the last video so we talked about NOS and there's a web page that you'll go to and read about so not talking about NOS we're talking about NOx that's NOS so this is an OX, so, and that's all of these up here. So those are the two emissions that we're working on, particular matter and nitrous oxides, and then it's all of them. And, and if we create more pressure and more heat to burn uh, the particular matter better, it creates nitrous oxide. If we reduce the temperature to eliminate, so if we eliminate this one, then we create particulate matter. So if we reduce the temperature we get rid of this. We increase the temperature we get particulate matter. So it's a combination where we're the two of them are opposites of each other and so the charts go like this and we'll see a chart later. And so you're trying to find that happy medium and how do we reduce them. So it's clear but it's unstable. It combines with oxygen and it turns into smog. So that's what's important about that. And they get into this whole thing here. We have unknown. So there's things in the air that's just <coughs> unknown that we collect and causes problems. Sulfur, one of the emissions that we used to have in diesel fuel, but we removed it. So we have, you know, low sulfur fuel, ultra low sulfur fuel, super ultra low sulfur fuel. There's all kinds of stuff out there trying to get rid of sulfur. And the problem with sulfur is to deal with particulate matter and nitrous oxide, we have these after treatment tools that we use. Like the urea, like the urea and the DOX, the DOS, and the, all the ones that we're going to talk about in chapter 15. But sulfur messes with them. So they had to remove the sulfur in order to be able to put the after treatment equipment on that's going to do us our job. So that's why if you have a new piece of equipment with a catalytic converter or a filter system or any of the urea, if you use high sulfur fuel or anything but ultra sulfur fuel, you're going to burn it up. So it's important as a technician, don't do that kind of stuff. So we kind of know that. And so particular, imagine there's my car. Actually, <laughs> Every once in a while, my car will do that, but it could be a malfunction. That's not my car. <laughs> it's not my car. So then they show fuel vapor is what burns, heat's what kind of breaks it apart, oxygen combines with it, makes it burn. So you have a particle of fuel, so you have raw fuel with vapor around it, with oxygen, and what doesn't burn is that carbon particle that's out there. 
The more we atomize it, so the newer machines, the newer equipment that's out there, we've increased the atomization, so we've increased our fuel injection pressure, trying to get better, smaller particles, smaller the particle, more surface area we have exposed to oxygen, the less particulate matter we're going to get. But not necessarily. You gotta remember, before electronic fuel injection, we had low injection pressures, injector pressures. And I say low, just talking 2,000 to, to about 45 or 5,000. I mean, that was the range of mechanical injectors at the time. And so, I mean, that's pretty high, but now that we're in the 30, 40,000 pressure range, that seems low. But up until we started getting into common rail systems and electronic fuel injectors, we always talk about high pressure fuel systems. Now they're the low pressure so fuel systems. Saying low, you're referring to as in the old school. When I say low, it's going to be the old school mechanical, pre computer. That would be low, and low is going to be 1800 to be the minimum up to like 5000. So direct injection is going to be 3 to 5, indirect is going to be 18 to 30 going to be what they were and we'll get into that more but as we increase that's part of the solution was to atomize it better the only way to atomize it common rail high pressure injection system atomize it better so that it breaks apart so we have less particulate matter without having to raise the temperature which created the NOS or the NOx don't don't say NOS bad thing so So here's our line, we have particulate matter, we have our NOx, we have fuel consumption. You can actually see that low fuel consumption and our happy medium between the two kind of all fall in the same line. So if we can maintain that line all the time, then we're good. How do we do that? Common rail electronic fuel injection system. So. We change the timing, we retard it, we advance it, we play with that. Again, there's a happy medium. We want to be in there with a mechanical system. You know, it just injects whatever all the time. It's the same time, whether if it's cold or hot, high pressure, or up in the top of a mountain, we're down by the ocean, it didn't matter. Middle of summer, middle of winter, it just injected it all the time at the same point. Now with common rail, computers, we take all that consideration, we adjust it, we retard it, we advance it, trying to maintain this sweet spot right well, here. The computers uh, nowadays on the cars, that will automatically retard it or... It's all, it's all monitored and then that sweet spot is tried to be picked every time. So we try to do that. So we already talked about the hazy appearance in the sky in smoggy days. We know what that is now. It's... Yeah. What is it? Smog. Smog, yes. Well, what does it come from? Pollution. And we know it's pollution. What creates smog? NOx. NOx. Very good. So small particles, uh, uh, small size of these particles are what make particulates hazardous. So the particulate matter that's floating around, we breathe it, causes cancer. Everybody dies from particulate matter. So why do they have a low RPM limit? We should know that by now. Why are diesel engines running at lower RPMs than gasoline engines? It's high compression. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's high compression, but that's not why we run, why they run low. Nope. What is, what is the, what's particular about diesel fuel that's different than gasoline? It has a much slower ignition time. Lower. It has a slow. When I dump gasoline on the floor, it evaporates pretty quick. When I dump diesel on the floor, it goes it slow. It doesn't vaporize very easily. And so diesels, because of the thick, the amount of energy that it has, the thickness of it, the amount of uh, uh, hydrocarbon that's in it, it takes more time to break it up and to release that energy. Gasoline breaks apart very easily and burns very quickly and doesn't have as much energy, but it, it vaporizes like super fast. So I can actually, 
I can get it to vaporize and pull the energy out at a high RPM and still get it out. In a diesel, it simply takes time. And if I push it too fast, what happens? It just goes out the exhaust pipe as particulate matter. It's just, I mean, you watch the drag races and the guy's got the, you know, yeah. tractor, truck, or whatever it is with the diesel, and just this roll in the old coal, or you're just pouring fuel through this engine and it's not burning because they're running too high RPM and they're dumping too much fuel in there and they're dumping this NOS that you talked about trying to get more oxygen to reduce some of that and get more power out of it but still too many RPMs the fuel itself does not release this energy fast enough we just can't get enough oxygen when we do that and it just blows out as particulate matter so it has to do with the volatility of the fuel so I look at it, we got dense smoke, visible smoke, 3,000 RPMs. We start getting over 3,000 RPMs and you're going to get visible smoke. Diesels don't like to run over 3,000 RPMs. So if we can, we can get them up to about four, but they don't like it and you're going to start seeing visible smoke or fuel start to, to get burned. So. Hey, that's out of my car. Not really. Well, my car is the same way. It sits up here just above three and you're redlining. In a, in a diesel, you'll see the red line come sooner. And it's not because the valves are going to float. In a car, redlining, the valves float. Simply, they can't open and close fast enough. And a diesel has nothing to do with valves floating. It's the smoke limit. You just get to a point where you're just, the fuel just can't burn. It just can't. It runs out of oxygen. Doesn't have enough time, and it might even have oxygen. It just doesn't have enough time for the oxygen to break the molecule down and to not just end up going out the tailpipe. So the red line on a diesel is going to be much smaller, much lower. So sulfates, we haven't really talked about sulfates very much. When diesel fuel is refined, it's pumped from the ground, there's sulfur is actually naturally in the oil. So that's where it's in. We remove it, we refine it, we retake it out again. It's been progressively reduced. So if you read your book, there's a couple of charts where they keep showing how the, the charts go down. And again, if we run sulfur in modern equipment with all these after treatment things, it ruins them. So we cannot run them in there. In the old ones, it was a good thing. It helped us out. But in today, it doesn't work. So the sulfur then was basically more like a, a lubricant as well? We used it as a lubricant, and it was in there. It was naturally occurring. It takes extra money to refine it out, so leave it in there. We didn't care. As we start refining the emissions and reducing emissions and stuff, sulfur has become a bad thing. It's, it's harming us. So let's try to take it out. Did they have a lead? In that tube, like to get gasoline at the time, no. or was no lead? No. They just have s sulfur. So, particular matter, s sulfur was added in there, and sulfur leads to acid rain and it leads to some other um, smog type of stuff. And then nitrous oxide is smog related. So, those are the standards. And then just the physical breathe them in and it gets in your lungs and causes problems. No lead. So carcinogens, they talk about carcinogens, cancer, emotionally in the lungs because you're going to breathe it in. So naturally that would be in your lungs. So they got some of these other things, but these are small compared to particulate matter. That's the number one cause of <coughs> health risk because it's floating in the air and you're breathing it. You're driving down the road, you got all these trucks down the road, cars, pickups, whatever that's diesel is spewing out smoke you're going to breathe it in. So you can see over time they've been working on it. They started way later than they did in gas. Gasoline engines clear back in the 60s they started trying to deal with emissions. You know so it wasn't until late 70s, somewhere in the 70s they started addressing it. They started looking at it, identifying it as a problem. We need to start doing something and really by 1990 is when they started going, okay, you've had time, what have you done? So they always talk about it, they give you some time to kind of deal with it, and that's what they did. 1990, you'll see all of a sudden, 
standards start hitting, start coming in. You can see another standard hit, another standard hit. You can see the difference between where it was before 1990 and where it is in 2010. It's a pretty dramatic change. So when I was young, I used to think it was cool. If a truck wasn't rolling coal out, it wasn't working. That's, that was a sign that it was cool. Well, you know, now it's just wasted money. When I see these guys in their pickups and they romp on it, it rolls out the old smoke. I'm just thinking, they got too much money because it's just raw fuel that's wasted. So, so about 2010, that's basically when they introduced uh, urea. Because I remember that's when I was in the program. That's yeah, when they, in here, they were starting to figure out the only way to do this is to add the filter system, the urea system, the SRX, the exhaust recirculation, all, all that stuff came in and started to be played with and toyed with and experimented with in this time frame. So back in here, I don't remember what they did back here. I didn't have to worry about it back then. So, and because this industry, this program, we didn't, I didn't deal with it. I never even studied it or never paid it. I paid attention to it because I live in a farm world and I keep trying to keep up, but I know it was coming. So I kind of was trying to see what they did, but it didn't hit our world until 2012, really. It started to impact us. And now it's 2015, a new standard went through the tier four final 2015 hit us so we are definitely impacted now so and it was a matter of time so we let we let the cars and the truck guys kind of try to figure something out and then we let the big truck guys figure something out and they go oh, well that's working we, well that didn't work that didn't work that that didn't work that works this didn't work this works okay let's take that system put it in ours because it works good so that's the nice thing about this industry is we don't we don't try things for the first time. We take the tried and true thing from the big guys who got lots of money, try all kinds of stuff, and then we implement what works. So they just shrink it and make it work. So what we're gonna be dealing with is gonna be a pretty bulletproof, pretty simplistic stuff. So that's the nice thing. So here's our emissions. A little bit of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, which is what? From last week? Unburned fuel. Unburned raw fuel. So this is unburned raw fuel. So we don't we don't have evaporative emissions. We just have spillage and leaks and that kind of stuff. And we also have hydrocarbons from where? What was the other thing they talked about earlier in this chapter? You were asleep then or what? Crankcase. So a crankcase, something coming out. So liquid matter coming out of our crankcase. So that was this one. This is the big one in particulate matter. So nitrous oxides in particulate matter is what we're dealing with. So 1980 on, we got that stuff. Is diesel dirty? In the old days, it was, I mean, it put out a lot of particulate matter. And so in itself, it was dirty when it talked about it. it had visible stuff that came out and it floated around and if it drove in your building, I mean, it caused your lungs to itch and because it was aggravating. And so it would cause you to sneeze. It goes back to the story from last time about killing yourself. So anyway, so legislation came in and kicked in, and, and sometimes legislation can be good. It really hasn't proved it bumped fuel economy up and cleaned up the atmosphere, and a lot of this just wasted fuel that was going out there is now not wasted. So we're saving natural resources, which is a good thing. I mean, it's being friendly to our environment. So you can't look at all this stuff as a terrible thing. At the time, we probably didn't like our environmentalists very well. So anyway, the amount of diesels on the road and the amount of diesels and what they did per ton. So they have a big discussion in your book about, you know, per ton a truck does a whole lot more than a car. So overall cars tend to put more pollution out than a truck per weight per ton type situation. But 
they still, and there's room to clean them up. And so they've been cleaning them up. So I mentioned decals. All vehicles have some kind of decal. This is going to be really common on any kind of automotive diesel truck. They have these decals as standard in the auto industry. Is it standard in this industry, in lawn equipment and construction equipment? I don't know. I imagine someplace they're going to have to have this listed because EPA is requiring that you tell me what, um, what, are the, what is this thing supposed to be? What is the baseline of this machine? So I imagine somewhere there's going to have to be some kind of an emissions decal on turf equipment. But because it's so new to us, I don't know what it looks like. Don't we have EPA emissions on all the gas engines? There's a sticker. Know, we have it down to a certain, there's a certification and it goes down to a certain horsepower. Mm -hmm. We don't see too many certifications on our gas engine applications, but there is some overseeing and it's really done at the manufacturer's level, not at our level. We don't have any requirements to go into a place to have my emissions tested. Whereas this is why it's on here. So when you pull into the EPA test center and they're like, check your tailpipe, they're comparing it to this chart. And because we don't have to take the lawnmowers in and have them tested, we don't have the chart. So the manufacturer, before they produce it, put it out there on the market, they have to go through an EPA regulation saying it has to be tested and all that. If you alter it afterwards, there's nothing out there to, to, to change or fine you. So, so it just kind of tells you, this tells the guy doing the testing what to find. What's he going to find? What systems are in place to meet this emissions and what should he be testing for? So they, different kinds of ones. All the vacuum hoses that run around and kind of cause a lot of chaos in your car. So standards, regular, uh, regulations are used in the United States. In California, so there's the California standard and then there's the federal standard. And there's only two standards. The, you can't, Oregon can't decide, nope, we're gonna do something different. You either follow California or you're gonna follow federal, but you can't follow your own. So they're all gonna fall under that. Oregon, Washington, California are all under California. So where we live here, we're all following California. So off-road diesel, it used to just be on-road stuff that they were concerned about. So the first part of those emission standards were light duty trucks, cars, diesel cars, stuff that was on the road. And then they went to over the road trucks and then they went to off-road. They went into these mining thing. You get you know, to a mine with these gigantic loaders and they're just belching out smoke. And so then they started going into off-road applications and started affecting off-road. And they started with the biggest diesels because the bigger the engine, the more volume you've got coming out, the more pollution you're gonna have. So they start with the big stuff and then they start working their way down. So it's taken a lot longer because the equipment in the off-road world lasts for a long time. I mean, there's still a lot of these, you go to these mines and stuff, there might be stuff that's 30, 40 years old. Well, it was way before we even thought about it. And they're not gonna just take a 500 horse engine and say, okay, let's just retrofit a brand new, Tier four emissions engine into it. Like a million dollar project. Yeah, it's just, it'd be so cost prohibitive. It'd be crazy. And so they have gone back to some of these products and actually retrofitted some stuff on them to kind of help filter it out, clean them up. But I mean, the actual solution would be to replace the equipment. And it depends on the county. You go to King County. Nothing can go into King County. You can't drive in or use something in King County without it being tier four, final emissions compliant. And so if I wanna go get a contract in the county, everything I own has to be compliant. It used to be in some counties, you know, a certain percentage of the equipment has to be tier four. So you might have a couple of oddball pieces of equipment that you don't use much, but you need it for the job. 
and it averages out because okay, those don't but everything else does and so it depends on the county and everybody is different same thing california now they won't allow any older semis in there for the if they're not here for her. It all depends on the county. So some counties have been that way for a while where you can't be in there. You go to the dock and all the trucks, they got all these old trucks that they used to move you know, the containers around and they had to go retrofit all these old trucks or buy new. Well, they didn't, couldn't afford to buy new trucks. They're this little single cab, single little thing that they just move things around. Well, they go buy a new one of those or buy a retrofit kit to, to monitor, do something with it, it was cheaper to modify it. And there was a bunch of grants that came out, so different groups, EPA groups said, hey, you do it, we'll help pay for it. And so we'll cover half the cost. So there's a lot of incentives that were out there, and you better do it right now because, you know, at the end of this year, we're taking that away. And so they kind of, you know, they had their ways of saying if you pump a lot of money into your equipment, we'll offset it by something. So that that was out there. Well you either you either do it, take this cash, or do it next year and pay it all yourself. And at the end of that year, you're gonna be required. It's not gonna be an option. So right now we're saying please do it. And here's some cash to help you do it. In a year and a half from now, you're required, you get rid of this equipment. So you're kinda of like mm. You got to do it. <laughs> so a lot of people did it. A lot of stuff changed. If you read the Diesel Progress magazine, you can see all kinds of old trucks and how they retrofit them. Old buses, city transit buses, converting it over, maybe switching them to, um, I want to say nitrogen, um, natural gas, or something else that they're running on. So different kinds of natural gas. So, so different standards, tier one, tier two, California standards, we talked about that. You have LEV2s, ULEVs, and SUs. So we got low emissions vehicles, ultra low emissions vehicles, and then super all low emissions. And actually there's one more, no emission, zero emission vehicles, which is electric cars. It's all electric, not like hybrid stuff. So all electric would be a no emissions vehicle. And so you can see there's lots of categories of vehicles or emission standards out there. And each one of those just adds a layer of complexity that's just a layer. And I mean, we went from the simple engine to elaborate. Well, when you go to electric, basic electric is a little simpler than ultra low emissions. Is it is actually way simpler than the ultra low because the ultra low when you actually have to run an engine or not run an engine you got a whole computer and a whole piece talking back and forth it's just there's a lot of complexity there so so this is kind of give you a basic time frame i don't see i mean you don't have to know every date and what happened at each date but the nice thing or which you should be taken away is we had a tier one we had a tier two tier three tier four interim just kind of like beginning of it and then final tier four so when you're reading the ads they're talking about hey we meet tier four we meet interim you kind of need to know what does that mean and it falls into years so 96 to 99 2001 204 then you can see here went to tier three I only had two years in that category. So we have three years here, two years here. Here we give you a little more time. So we got five years in interim, because that's when we start getting into these big trucks, off-road equipment. That stuff started hitting. And you're talking about a whole industry that's not wanting to pour a lot of money into a lot of million dollar equipment. I mean, they're talking about stuff that's very expensive. And then tier four final from 2012, 2015. And so as of December of 2015, that's it, we're done. You've got to meet tier four final emissions. So, and you can see the difference. I mean, literally the exhaust pipe was almost, I mean, you're out there farming, 
what comes out of the exhaust pipe will be cleaner than what goes in the in air cleaner. It would be safer to just to breathe out of the tailpipe than it would be to be in the intake manifold because it'll clean all the dirt out and, and it's going to virtually put out almost nothing. So they want zero emissions to come out that exhaust pipe. That's their ultimate goal. Is it possible? Uh, it's, it's maybe not 100% possible, but you obviously were been able to get it pretty darn low. So it's way lower than I ever thought they did, could get it, and way lower than most people thought you could ever get it. So, so who knows? So you can never say never, <laughs> because back here. There's no way. There's no way we can reach this. We're, we're here, and there's no way we're going to get here. Oh, there's no way we're going to get here. Well, there's no way we're going to get here. Well, we're there. The whole two-cycle world, well, they're going to be gone. You do this, all two cycles will go away. That's the end of the two-cycle. It's the death of it. They're still here. They meet the emissions. Technology changes, and computers have helped change that. So. Could they have forced this emission stuff 20 years ago? No. We didn't have the technology, we didn't have the computer technology to analyze it to be able to figure it out. But computer technology has allowed us to do it. <clears throat> In this chart, which you've seen before, what I don't understand about this chart, and I can't find it in your book, maybe I'm just missing it, is this whole bin thing. Bin one, bin two, bin five. I mean, they show you, they say go to the chart, but they don't say in there what is the bin. So do I care? No, I, it doesn't matter. The whole point is it just kept getting smaller. And there is a Euro standard that's out there that's kind of on par with what we're doing. There's a Canadian standard. The Canadian standard matches our EPA standards. So if you go into Canada or bring something out of Canada into the United States, the emission standards in Canada follow our federal mandate. Those two are the same. We're actually in Oregon, Washington, California are all on the California standard. So I might not be able to pull something out of Canada into certain counties in Washington or Oregon. So, so anyway. So looking at our standards or our uh, emissions, how are we going to know that we're meeting it, or if it doesn't meet it, how do we know what's causing the problem? And that's where in the automotive world, this OBD or OBD2, so they're on OBD2, it's just you have a computer, computer's monitoring all this stuff, it's all fed into a computer, we have a diagnostic tool that we plug in, and it goes through and it reads, where is the emissions coming from? Where is the failure that's leading to it? So. When I went to the Toro class, and I've been to some other classes, they're just hooking a laptop into it, and they're reading the information on a laptop. So at this point, um, it's so new to this industry, what is the outdoor power industry doing to read the codes and solve the problems? And at this point, from what I've seen, it's done on a computer. You take your laptop, you plug it in, and then you can go in and you can turn injectors off, you can turn injectors on, you can change standards, you can check rates, you can do all kinds of stuff. But in this, at this point, they're using a computer screen, which what is an OBD? OBD, you know, reader. It's like a miniature computer that's just reading these codes. We already have a laptop. Why do we already have a laptop? All of our service manuals, tech manuals, everything's on the computer. We're all Bluetooth. We're supposed to be, you know, some of us with our little flip phones. Not quite any of those things, but, you know, we got it to where our phone, we can walk up and we can put an adapter and we can actually do it. So why go buy another tool when our smartphones are already smarter than an OBD2 OBD reader? So this industry is kind of, I think they're going to bypass the OBD2 readers and go right to just your phone or a computer. So, unless, and your phone is a computer, really, so. Unless people, some mechanics just like a big clunky thing with buttons for the shop. 
Well, that's where you just have your laptop. Yeah. And so you're going to plug your laptop in, and I have a keyboard I can type, so I'm not trying to do something on a little smartphone. So, but the nice uh, thing is, with the, because in our industry it, it is so robust and it gets down to us, like the Pacific Gulf and Turf, they were telling me they have never had an issue with the emission systems. Yeah. The, the problems with the emission systems, when I mean, you look at all this, where is the problem going to come? What's going to create a problem in the emission system? Knowing what you know at this point, we're only in chapter two. Where is the failure going to come in the emission system? System. Sure. It's going to come from three things, really. The fuel we already talked about. So putting the wrong stale fuel in there, trying to burn stale fuel, that's going to cause a problem. So that's going to be one of the number one problems with, it's the same problem in the two-cycle world, same problem in the gas world. It's going to screw up that particulate filter, and then we're trying to put your urea and stuff in there, and putting bad fuel, cheap fuel. My brother tried to use different kind of urea than what they sell. So instead of buying death in the bowel, I'm a farmer, let's just go get some urea and put it in there. So I mean, he's got this... 200 and some thousand dollar tractor, 300 thousand dollar tractor, and he decides to put urea in that wasn't deaf. So and then he couldn't figure out why it threw a code and it wouldn't run. So they came out and they had to flush the whole system and drain it all out, put in real deaf, and then it worked fine. So somebody trying to use non appropriate material in there, trying to save some money. It's going to cost them a fortune. So that's where, I mean, the technician came out. What they do? They dealt with the farmer's stupidity. So that's what's going to get this. So fuel. Second one's going to be idling, excessive idling. These systems are designed to run at full bore. If I have a machine and I just let it sit around and idle all the time, I have low temperatures, um, low airflow. I'm going to have problems with the stuff atomized doing what it does, and that's going to cause a problem. When you get into that particulate filter, it needs to get hot enough to burn up the particulates. And if the guy gets on his little diesel lawn and garden tractor and drives out to the mailbox and gets his mail and drives back, and you will be amazed at how many people use their lawnmower to go get the mail and to go do stuff because it's handy, it's simple, it's small, and you know they have a bad leg or whatever, and they that's how they go get their mail every day is they take their lawnmower. Well, if you had a diesel and they just kind of tool out there, it's not getting hot, it's gonna cause a problem. So low RPM operation is gonna be the second problem and it's gonna mess up the system. So wouldn't there also be certain equipment applications where it could be a problem, say a utility vehicle, maybe some grounds they drive it around a lot and it just They're picking up trash yeah. or they're picking up weeds along so the guy drives along, stops and he gets out and pulls some weeds and he's just kind of tooling around campus, just checking things out. So even if he's driving somewhat hard, if you have no weight in the vehicle and you drive, you know, quarter of a mile down the road and park or you drive around the block and shut it off and shut it off. So you shut it off and on all the time but when you start it up whew, you get this ex excess amount of fuel right. that's going through. Yeah. Yeah. Stop and go low load operation. Those are going to cause problems in our diesel world. And in the auto industry they're using the automatic transmissions now to slightly load the engines at a high idle. Get if it's computer controlled and the computer says, hey, I need to do something different, the computer could bring the RPMs up, keep the gears down, and do it. But if I'm controlling it because I got a manual transmission. Well, I think they were doing it even in park. They were leaving it in park and using the torque. It's possible. Down. And that's where the computer would come in and do something. So right now, even in your pickup, like my pickup, I have a Power Stroke, and I have a 2001. And if I go out and start it up and just walk away from it, all of a sudden the RPMs will come up and then you'll hear this hissing sound. And so the turbo, it'll actually block the turbo, put the back pressure on it, trying to warm the engine up so that it actually burns it out. And it doesn't have all this emission standard on it. But even back then, 2000, 99, back in 99, they were already trying to get the engine warmed up faster 
to remove particulate matter, some of the other things. But so there's a third one, and now that you guys talked, I forgot what the third one was. So. So the fuel itself, and then low RPM operations. Uh, those are going to be the two main ones. So there's another one that I thought of, and I can't remember what the third one would be. It could be. No. If you try to go in and actually modify sensors, cut out sensors and stuff, that's going to screw it up too. So it really becomes operator intervention, trying to modify it in some way. So if they try to, to bypass something, it's going to screw them up. So maintenance too. And it's going to be maintenance. So poor maintenance, not changing your oils in time, not doing with the air cleaner correctly. So poor maintenance, I guess, would be the third one. Poor maintenance or, you know, Operator tampering. Those are the things that you're going to be dealing with. So when there's a problem, it's because they were messing with it. If they were running it in the normal, proper application, I, I just don't see it. So, so the monitors, we're going to have some kind of computer system that's monitoring all this. There's all the different pieces. When you look in your book, they give you this big, long list of things that they're actually checking. So all the different systems, there's a big long list, so I'm not going to read it. So it's on page 35. So in chapter, I think it's 15, we're going to get into the after treatment technology, what's actually physically in here, what this DPF substrate's going to be, oxidation catalyst, so OCS. And SCR. So we got all these definitions and def. We're going to be looking at them closely in another chapter, so I'm not going to get into them here. But they're there. They're, they're on stuff that we have today. They're on everything bigger than us. Been in the industry for a while. So you take your car in to have it checked. They hook it up to your tailpipe. They're going to be pulling air in, they got all kinds of stuff, collecting all kinds of data to make sure that you are being friendly to the environment. So there's uh, EP standards that are out there, durability standards, so equipment has to reach certain durability. You have to be able to maintain this for so many years and so many miles. And so here to meet an LEV or ultra low vehicle, uh, low emissions vehicle. These are the different standards. So, so here's a tier 2 bin 5. I don't know. So, But you can see these are the different emissions and then your vehicle has to go 120,000 miles or 11 years and it can't exceed that. So and that's been in the auto industry for a long time. I had a Honda Civic that was a 96 Honda Civic and they had a warranty recall. It had 70 some thousand miles on it and they changed all of the ignition parts on it. So I got new coils and new wires and new spark plugs and all kinds of, everything got replaced new because of this durability. There was some lawsuit thing and their, their ignition system didn't last enough years so they had to go through and under no cost to me, it all got replaced. And it falls under this durability thing. So in the auto world, we use OBD2. And there's a little plug-in underneath your dash that you plug into. Would it be wise to have one of those in your toolbox? Yeah, I mean, you're eventually gonna get to work on something that needs it. It's, you need it to talk to the computer. The tier two emission standards are structured into eight permanent and three temporary certification levels of different stringencies called certification bins. An average fleet standard for NOx emissions. So the, the bins are just levels of certification of emission. So does it have to do with the vehicles themselves, like automotive? Off-road, on-road, yeah. so the bins are, 
the different categories of people and what their standards are going to be. Yeah, vehicle right. manufacturers have a choice to certify particular vehicles to any of the available bins. When fully implemented in 2009, the average NOx emissions of the entire light duty vehicle fleet sold by each manufacturer has to meet the average NOx standard of 0.07 G slash MI. Temporary certification bins, bins 9, 10, and MDPV bin 11, with more relaxed emission limits, are available in the phasing period and expire after 2008. So really, realistically, none of that matters to us because that was all in the old days. So we have got past, and with tier four, it's all gone. You have to meet all those emissions. So it's kind of nice to know, yes, you can fall in these different categories. And that was part of the whole, okay, we're gonna give you a chance. You can be in one of these bins, but your average of all of your fleet has to meet this number down here. So they put their stuffs in different bins, they took all the numbers, averaged them out at the end of the day. We can have some dirty stuff, we can have some clean stuff, but we have to have an average of this. So they have two examples, we, a Nissan car and a Hummer. A Hummer is a bin one or two, and a Nissan car is four or six. It's a rather low emissions vehicle. We did that in the two cycle world. You could have a four stroke, you know, uh, the four mixed trimmer, and then you had a chainsaw. So as long as the numbers of chainsaws and the number of four stroke backpack blowers or whatever, you took the average of all of them, as long as the average was fine, you could have some chainsaws that were dirty. And that was the big thing was it was hard to get a chainsaw to turn fast enough with the four mix. And the same thing with Shindawa. Shindawa had the same thing when they had their C4 technology, they had some chainsaws that were dirty, C4 super clean, average together, there's where we were. But now, the averaging is going away. And that's what's happening with the bins. The bins were there, you could average, now averaging is done. With tier four final, averaging has gone away. We can't have dirty and Basically, clean. Have it. <laughs> yep. So when we talk about um, particulate matter. They talk about opacity. Opacity. Opacity is actually visible smoke. So they have these little lenses, and they hold them up, and they're you know how much visible smoke is there. And so this is you know you can't see through it. Forty percent, one hundred and ten percent. So it's just they have these little lenses that can actually look through, shooting light through it. How much visible smoke is there? And that was part of that testing procedure. Emissions threshold limits. So you can see here, this is going back when they actually had all this averaging going on. Hydrocarbons, this was a percentage. How much can we have with this hydrocarbon? So here's the date and here's the limit. And here's the limit, not available. So. If you're really interested in it, it's in your book. It's not that important to me. So this is the test equipment when you went into the little station with the Department of Transportation and they smog test you. They plug this little thing into your tailpipe just like they do right here. And they smog test you. So yes, I know that there is certain areas that you have to get it tested in order to like Spokane and every it's just in big cities, hasn't been in Walla Walla. They haven't been in Yuma Pine yet. So opacity, this is a visible smoke. They have the snap test here. The snap test would be you step on the accelerator, just put it to the floor, and you can only have visible smoke for so many seconds. So you have three seconds to go back to less than a certain amount of visible smoke. So when they first went into the standards and stuff. You could have visible smoke, but you'd only see smoke out of these trucks when they changed gears and stepped on the accelerator. And so they had a couple of seconds of smoke, and that's that snap test. So you'd stomp on the accelerator, you'll get a puff of smoke, because you need excess fuel to get RPMs. We get the RPMs, and you gotta go back to clear. So, so that's what a snap test is. Here's the 
Instead of emissions, uh, vehicle weight tier two standards are divided into several numbered bins. 11 bins were initially defined, with bin one being the cleanest and bin 11 being the dirtiest. However, bins 9, 10, and 11 are temporary. Only the first 10 bins were used for light duty vehicles below 8,500 pounds, but medium duty passenger vehicles up to 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight and to all 11 bins. Manufacturers can make vehicles which fit into any of the available bins but still must meet average targets for their entire fleet. So number one was the cleanest? Number one being the cleanest and number one. And what did they say the Hummer was? Six or seven? I read it back. It was like yeah, six or seven. Yeah, and the other one was a one, so super clean, and then we have some super dirty, or relatively yeah, dirty. And bins so, nine and ten were phased out in 2006. So that concludes chapter two, and really it's, we're just kind of talking about those standards. You can see the standards have changed, and you can see in recent years, those standards changed pretty quick. Are they done? No. There's still more standards coming. By 22, 2022, there's another standard that's going to hit this industry. And so we're going to see more. And you just, you got to stay on top of it to figure out what's going to happen. Is it a source of grave concern as a technician? No. In some ways, it's cleaned the systems up. In some ways, it's added a layer of complexity. We got to use a computer to do most of our diagnostics. We have a lot more sensors and stuff that we got to pay attention to. You got to know the system and you got to be, under, you have to understand fuel quality and be able to deal with fuel quality issues. You need to do your maintenance practices correctly. You cannot screw those up. You can't leave the air filter loose. You can't put a dirty air filter. You can't be blowing the air filter out with a hose and blowing a hole in it, sticking it back in, because it's gonna be really expensive. Or starting to modify them and removing some of that stuff. You don't need it. You start taking it off and the computer's just gonna shut the machine off. Can that cost some of the Filtration and emissions devices problems with the dirty air. Yes. So that would be and what's going to happen with dirt? It's going to start wearing the rings. We're going to get more oil. Oil is going to affect our filtration system, and it's going to cause a whole lot of the problems. So we're going to see some failures of the exhaust system when we start seeing low um, compression and stuff like that in my engine. So. What is critical of diesel engines? Same thing that was critical before, maintenance. Proper maintenance. Putting a paper towel into the oil tank to kind of help suck up some of that oil is not a good idea. So that is it. So if you want to stop there?